Hey everybody and welcome to the Coastal Noise Podcast. I'm your host as always, Stefan Lawson. Today on the show, our 32nd episode, we have Tiffany Langlinez and Nathan Pierce. Both my guests today are very dedicated, very motivated individuals in the fashion industry and we're going to talk a lot about what they're doing uh, in their in their field and how their passions are driving what it is that they're creating and what they believe in. I just want to take two minutes before we start the show. If you want to hear more podcasts, you can go to the podcast page and click on any of the shows that are there. You can listen to it uh, straight off the website or better yet, you can click on the file download button and save it to your computer, save it to your phone. And that way you don't have to worry about internet lag time or anything like that. You can just uh, stop it, start it whenever you'd like at your convenience, and you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, bog down of internet traffic from other folks trying to access the audio files and whatnot. Uh, if you go to the blog page, I have uh, a new blog up that uh, tells a little bit of the backstory of the Diaverville Crawfish Festival that happened last Saturday. Uh, myself and Danielle Lynn, we both played together at the show and it was a fantastic time uh, one of the best shows I think I've ever done one of the most fun and um, I just take a little time to give thanks to uh, a couple of the people that helped make it possible and there are a bunch of pictures that um, our mutual friend Nikki Funk took and they're great pictures and uh, so check it out and there's also uh, an extended show notes uh, blog that uh, goes into a little bit of the details of what uh, we talked about on the previous podcast with Roscoe Bandana. You can also hear their episode on the podcast page, of course. If you look for the icons on Coastal Noise, we have Twitter and Facebook pages. You can go there, uh, give us a follow. And of course, it's always appreciated if you show your support through liking uh, things that we post or sharing anything. So that's it. We're going to go ahead and start up. Um, oh, by the way, the uh, one year anniversary of Coastal Noise, the first episode is going to be June 10th. And uh, we've got um, some plans in the works for what we're going to do. And also we uh, have been talking with the guys at Crest Live again, Nick Quave and Chase Taylor about a another podcast, a follow up podcast before Crest Live goes live uh, in early July. So more on that in, a, in, in the future. So let's go ahead and get started. This is Coastal Noise Podcast, episode 32. Enjoy. Hey, it was a great podcast, but that part about atheism... (laughs) Um... (laughs) <laughs> so how about a new story a recent uh this past week a robot was in the pacific ocean and it was a multi-million dollar uh loss from this from this robot that was designed in 2008 for five million dollars and they sent it down to uh the like as far as down they, they could go in the pacific ocean in new zealand and it imploded from the pressure that was so severe. So, um, $5 million loss right down the drain. Speaking of bad business moves right there, uh, it was called Neros and it was supposed to be in its final stage of a 10 kilometer dive in the Kermatic Trench. And, uh, speaking of New Zealand, Josh Kermatic, it's his birthday over in Australia. It's May Shout 17th. Yep. We miss Happy you, buddy. Happy birthday. Um, yeah, the the robot was built for high risk, high reward uh, research, and uh, it had traveled to the the deepest point in the ocean, which is uh, the Challenger Deep. It had traveled 11 uh, kilometers or 11,000 kilometers, one of those, uh, and explored the world's deepest known hydrothermal vents along the Cayman Rise in the Caribbean Sea. So, goodbye, robot. You will be missed. <laughs> Well, at least I knew that it was the high risk, high reward move going into it. Yeah. My concern when I first heard the story was that they just sent it down there and had no idea that there was a possibility that it was going to implode. 
So that's my two cents. <laughs> I feel much better knowing that they knew there was a chance it was going to blow up. What really matters is what I think we're seeing now is in grocery stores, um, food prices and stuff right. will most likely be going up. I've seen a lot of stuff uh, in that regards. Um, there's a new White House National Climate Assessment report that's suggesting it. And in March, the U.S. Department of Agriculture projected prices to increase this year by anywhere between 2.5 and 3.5 percent. Um, and and I, then I just happened to hear a, a news radio uh, segment about it where they were going around interviewing people and they were talking about how uh, common grocery goods they've noticed have started going up, whether it be eggs or cheese or balloons. Right. It's all inflating. So, um, so I think that's something that's, uh, that more people are worried about even more so than, uh, like unemployment or, um, I think it was paying loans or something like that. Because I mean, pretty much you got to have food. It's, it's affecting so. everybody's lives instead of just the people who aren't, aren't employed. You know, it's mm -hmm. the wealthy are being affected by inflated prices just as much as everybody else. So, um, I'm sure there's a pretty big uproar and concern about that. Mm -hmm. Tiff. What's your opinion? <clears throat> you haven't talked too much over there. <laughs> well, what's been in what's been going on in the business world? Uh, in the business world, in particular, for what you were just speaking about, I've noticed in a lot of different restaurants and um, local mom and pop stores, and specifically in New Orleans where I live right now, that it is affecting their price their pricing and uh, their particular uh, way of the, the logistics that they run their businesses with the rise of prices and uh, groceries and um, looking into where they get their wholesale goods too. So uh, it, it's affecting these small people in, in the community. And I know that um, in that particular sense, um, it's also making an effect on the tourism that we have in uh, New Orleans. I know that New Orleans has boasted some of the best tourism in the past couple of years. The percentage has risen incredibly, especially in the um, <clears throat> amounts of the people that come in from foreign places. And I know that the rise in prices for the things that um, specifically in food and it will affect the entertainment industry. And I know that it's going to be extremely curious as to what people are going to be able to do to combat these rising prices. Do you think it'll have any effect on fashion? I definitely think so. I know that through uh, the expendable income that people have outside mm. of what they already spend for their necessary uh, needs in the way that they live and food, uh, fashion is one of the most expendable items and people might forego uh, getting that new dress, getting that that new piece of jewelry whenever they have more uh, important things that they need to be getting right now. So it, it's very interesting to see what people are going to be choosing to spend their money on. And I know that's going to affect a lot in the way my pricing is structured and uh, my certain demographic for who I'm targeting with my brand. So you think that Ferret and Napoleon will fare okay if you do the right, correct adjustments? I definitely think that Ferret and Napoleon is keeping its customer and consumer in mind because, again, um, with the way that we're structured, we're not trying to just market to anyone. It's a certain kind of person, and that person is a bold, fun-loving individual, you know, thinking about somewhere in your teens to late 20s, and the people that make that particular sacrifice to be fashionable, to be up with the times, and uh, work with um anything to express themselves because that's a huge factor in the way that they live their lives. So uh, marketing towards them and working with them and the way that we structure a lot of things is um, very important. You're, this is a recent uh, kind of takeoff for you. You just started up in March and you're doing fairly well with it, right? Well, actually I started in November of last year. I decided to get a an early Christmas gift from my parents. I asked them for a sewing machine because one day, um, as a lot of my decisions tend to pan out, I just up and decide to do something. And I decided that I would like to go ahead and make 
clothing because I wasn't satisfied with what consumers were offered these days. I mean, I would always look at something and think, well, you know, if you could change this top by making it shorter, you know, making it wider, cutting it here, adding this, then it would be a perfect top. But then essentially it would be a completely different top or article of clothing. So one of the things that I wanted to do was to create something for myself that I would be completely satisfied the first time rather than making those adjustments afterwards. You know, buying a top and then doing all those adjustments just isn't worth it to me. So working through that, I decided on a whim shortly thereafter, after I um, began teaching myself how to sew that I would apply to Fashion Week New Orleans. And they have a top design competition, which is very similar to Project Runway. And right now that's a very popular um program and uh, series on Lifetime. It used to be on Bravo TV, I believe. And um, through that, the particular 10 people that were chosen, I, I got selected. Um, and those people were able to show a collection at Fashion Week New Orleans in March this year. So essentially when uh, you think that I launched during then is that all the previous groundwork started in November and then in March, it really took off from there. And you no, know, you're based out of New Orleans, but you you were raised here on the coast. Yes. How has both places influenced what you've put into your design? Well, I am a born and raised Biloxi girl, Southern girl through and through. And one of the biggest things that I've always been a huge advocate of is always remembering where you come from and always pulling from your roots. One of the big signature things that you can see in my particular jewelry line right now is that I have this oyster shell symbol and every single piece that I have designed comes right back to the Gulf Coast area. I'm so inspired by um, everyday Southern scenes that you can see um, in any of these Southern Southern states. And then um, from me moving into New Orleans recently, I know that through so many different things that I've been a part of, uh, I was recently on the committee for Sippin' and Seersucker benefiting the arts for uh, the Ogden Museum, which is a museum for Southern arts located in downtown New Orleans. Um, that is my sort of um, owed to always following this southern kind of lifestyle and um, paying back to the arts too because everything that we do here is inspired by so many um, of the great southern ideals and I, I always want to make sure that in Ferret and Napoleon that I always make sure that I um, pull back from where I came from and where it's leading to me next. And where do you see it going? What's the goal of the entire expansion? My overall goal right now and what I'm ultimately working on is that a lot of people forget that my jewelry is just only an accent. Whenever I was preparing for the top design competition in the um, Fashion Week New Orleans, I wanted to make sure that overall I wasn't just putting clothing out into the particular runway, that I was actually putting together looks, an entire collection, an entire look for people to be able to um, pull ideas and inspiration from and get exactly what I'm, get, uh, what I'm trying to put my vision out there. And um, jewelry happened to be the most sustainable avenue after the fashion show. And as I moved towards um, working with getting myself off of the ground as a startup business and an emerging designer. I know that one of the big things for me was to go and um, make sure that I had the perfect complementary piece. And, and in that, it, it happened to be an oyster shell that I could incorporate in the jewelry that I had in each model that presented a look in the uh, runway collection. And um, again, whenever I say that jewelry, it was the perfect accent to my uh, clothing line. One of the biggest things is that it's not my end all be all. One of the biggest things I know that I'm working towards is an entire clothing line. I'm working on a mini capsule collection right now with hand printed, hand sketched particular d patterns and designs that I'm going to have transferred into fabric. And from that fabric, I will 
design an entire collection of po possibly six pieces that I will debut in spring of 2015. And um, working with my graphic design intern, uh, I have definitely gotten some pieces that I'm waiting to come in next week to uh, preview and see how they'll go from there. Very cool. Uh, what previous experiences have you had in your life that prepared you for for this step in the in the fashion world? What's especially funny about this is that I always felt that fashion was never and and forgive me for anyone that I offend in saying this. It was never a real possibility as a job. I always thought that whenever I was growing up that I was going to get that nine to five job and, you know, work in the corporate world and do everything that I needed to do in order to make enough money to have fun in life. And that's all that I needed. But as I was preparing for everything, you know, I went through school and got a business administration major and everything that was concentrated in that was very um, focused on one particular idea and I realized as I was trying to work towards that uh, corporate world and corporate lifestyle, it wasn't what I wanted at all. Mm -hmm. And um, everything that I learned through trying to obtain this degree as well as working um, for the American Diabetes Association right now, I've worked in the nonprofit world in full capacity in so many different ways that um, things that I've learned through that has prepared me to definitely value what I'm taking in this extremely creative new path and avenue that I'm going to follow in life because um, I definitely see in what works for some people and what definitely wor doesn't work for me and what I want to um, go against the grain in um, moving forward and getting my collection off the ground. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, y'all, I mean, you and Nathan, y'all have known each other for a while and y'all are kind of in the same business kind of deal, the same industry, I should say. Um, what What is y'all's, when did y'all connect and first begin kind of dabbling? Well, Nathan and I have known each other since we were freshmen in college, and um, if anybody knows us, we were always that just duo that probably raised hell on campus and honestly probably didn't do any of our work, didn't deserve to be at Millsaps. Mm. And, um, Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I, we had a lot of fun at Millsaps, and we did a lot of things that um, I feel like a lot of people wish that they had been a part of, especially because um, studies were such a huge thing at Millsaps, but um, it was either, you know, you decided to have fun or you didn't, and then um, trying to balance everything on top of that. So, um, but I've, Nate, I've known Nathan for such a long time, and um, he, he's definitely pursued a lot of his own business ventures himself and uh, found himself very successful, and I know that I find inspiration in all the things that he does, and that helps me a lot with my particular clothing he's line touched. right now. <laughs> I'm very touched. Thanks, Tiff. Can you comment on that? Can you yeah. tell us a little bit about your your you know your own little swing in, yeah. in the side of the story? Um, you know, my whole thing happened. I was very fortunate when my whole clothing line took off. Um, my business partner and I kind of started out as a screen print company, um, just looking for a way to make a little bit extra money and not wanting to work in a cubicle all day every day. Um, so we kind of uh, started this little screen print business, basically making prints for um, the local fraternities and sororities for their theme parties. And, um, next thing, you know, um, one of the sororities ended up requesting, um, a custom pocket or they actually requested a screen print design on a pocket t-shirt that was long sleeve. And at that time they didn't even offer a, uh, pocket on a long sleeve t-shirt. So it was kind of an issue. Well, when we ended up going back to the drawing board and figuring out what we could do, because it was a couple thousand dollar order. Um, what we came up with was that we would figure out a way to sew these pockets onto the t-shirts ourselves. So, uh, we ended up hiring a fraternity brother of ours who was, um, looking for a place to, uh, to live. And, uh, we told him, I'll tell you what, you can move into our rental home. Um, and in exchange, you'll teach yourself how to sew. So we went to Walmart, bought him a sewing machine and, uh, he started sewing the pockets. Well, in the midst of him sewing those pockets onto t-shirts, um, we kind of realized that if we're going to be sewing pockets onto these t-shirts, why don't we mix up the pocket combinations and do different color pockets? Um, and just like that, our clothing line was born. Um, we actually, um, are the innovators and the originators of the custom pocket t-shirt into the preppy market. 
uh, we launched it and it was an overnight success, just blew up. Um, and then it ended up getting to the point where manufacturing was our biggest issue and our biggest concern. Um, too many sales is um, the main cause of bankruptcies in business just as much as not enough sales. Um, a lot of people don't know that. You got to figure out how to grow with it rapidly or you're going to get left in the dust. So um, we actually hired a couple of ladies off Craigslist when sales got too much and uh, we rented out an apartment building, set up a conference table in there, bought them sewing machines and we had about four or five ladies from Craigslist that were trying to keep up with orders at minimum wage for a while. Um, and that got us through for a little bit. Um, and even during that time, we had too many orders to keep up with. Um, if you had ordered from us at that time, actually, it was about a two month production time before your product would even get to you. Um, and people were still buying it, you know, they didn't care about the production time. So, um, they got to the point where we moved our manufacturing again to a plant in Tylertown, Mississippi, who was actually hurting kind of bad. And, uh, their main source of income was government contracts. You know, they were doing postal service shirts for, uh, for the government. And, um, a lot of people know that uh, American manufacturing isn't exactly a booming business right now. Um, it's been hurting for quite some time, especially the government contract manufacturing plants. Um, they don't exactly have a ton of, um, I guess, contracts to be working on. Um, they're, they're cutting back big time as far as the government goes. Um, so it was perfect timing for them. Um, and it was perfect timing for us and it all just worked out perfectly. And, uh, but we ended up um, working it out with them, uh, a perfect deal, and it was right before Christmas. And at that point, we hadn't had a, um, a sale on any of our products because we already couldn't keep up with full retail pricing. Um, and the plan was to have the first sale of the year for Christmas, the Black Friday to Cyber Monday. Um, so we launched the sale and uh, with no expectations. We didn't really know what was going to happen. And um, once we launched it, it was a blowout. Um, I think we ended up doing 10,000 shirts in one weekend. Wow. Um, and even with the capacity of that manufacturing plant who had about a hundred workers to 200 workers at the time, um, even they couldn't keep up with the orders. So not only that, but they were used to doing big time, big shirt contracts to where they were doing 10,000 to 20,000 production runs while well, ours were all custom products. So it wasn't the same as lining up a bunch of shirts and doing one big run. It was more of a hybrid between a tailor shop and a production line. Um, so we had to make some serious adjustments to even their plant in order to keep up with production because it was such a hassle um, in order to make our custom products in such a large quantity. So it ended up, long story short, we basically managed their plant for them for our own clothing line. Well, we were paying them to do the managing, but we were the ones running the plant. So there was no need in us really um, even paying them a fee or using them as ma a manufacturer anymore. Um, after that sale, we had enough money generated to where um, we figured it was time to go ahead and suck it up and buy all of our own sewing machines and start our own manufacturing business. Um, so that's where we are today. Um, we've got two plants in Columbia, Mississippi, where all of our products are made. Um, we make dress shirts like I'm wearing right now from scratch. We make um, the pockets onto t-shirts. We do uh, pajamas for girls, women's wovens. We're about to get into bathing suits, shorts, pants, and blazers. Um, so, you know, it's, it's very satisfying having American workers and, uh, trying to bring back the manufacturing in America. Um, but, uh, but that's kind of our story and how we got started. So very cool. Yep. And where can people go to check out? They can go to fraternitycollection.com. Um, and then we're also in about 400 retail stores across the country. Um, and I would let you know some of the local ones around here if I knew them off the top of my head. But uh, they, they should be online for them to go check them out as well. You want to hear another news story that happened recently? Hit us uh, up. So what do we got here? Uh, speaking of money, as we're talking about money, there's a recent incident where um, not only money but also college kids – um, a bunch of roommates found $41,000 in an old couch that they bought from the Salvation Army. So lucky find. They bought it for $20. Nice. So the, you know, the return's pretty good on the investment to say the least. Um, they said they bought it in April, um, and they opened it up and there was just $41,000 stashed inside, um, and they took it out all, 
put it all on a bed and just started counting it, counting it up. And uh, they said they didn't know what to do at first, you know. And um, they eventually found like a pay stub or something like that. But they found uh, the couch used to who the couch used to belong to, and it was a uh, an older lady. And they said that they you know had this huge huge moral debate on what they were going to do. Um, you know, do we turn it, return it to this 91 year old lady or, you know, just keep it and not tell anybody about it. Um, and they eventually went down to her neighborhood, which they said was a, a rough neighborhood. It looked pretty bad and there were beware dog signs and all these kinds of things. Um, it was in, uh, the woman's house was in Hudson Valley and they described it as rustic and all these kinds of things. And, um, the woman was, was of course, is ecstatic about the return apparently their fan her family had put her like life savings or something like that or like some money they were leaving to her and they hid it or something like that in the couch and uh like i don't know if she had any knowledge of it or or whatever um but uh they she ended up giving them like a thousand dollars for the find so um still a payoff i guess but forty one thousand dollars on the couch how about that that's awesome. I just bought a couch off of Craigslist and all there was was cat fur in it. <laughs> um, after Katrina, I found I found a red Stratocaster, a Fender guitar, and it was in a case and everything. And what can I say? People were looting it. everywhere, so... <laughs> Might as, well, might as well take your pill, right? Well, um, you know, it was either going to sit there and get water damaged on it because it had, it was from a local pawn shop or something that had just, I mean, people were walking around every, everywhere just picking stuff up and I'm a guitar player. So I was like, you know, and this was like the guitar I wanted basically. So for it to just fall into my lap, I was like, I'm going to bring this home to keep it safe in the name of safety. So I did. And then, um, so then my plan was to get it kind of refixed up and all this, these kinds of things, uh, cause it was in pretty good shape. It just needed a little bit of a fix up. Well, without telling me, my dad took it and he brought it to a guitar tech and asked him if he would repair it. The guy was like, man, this guitar looks just like my friend's guitar. And then he was looking at it and he was looked at the serial number. He's like, this is my friend's guitar. <laughs> so what happened? Well, <laughs> uh, they called the guy up and, uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, my dad came home and told me and he was like, I'm real sorry. I took your t guitar to go get fixed. And I was like, well, that's okay. And he was like, no, no. The guy recognized it and it, you know, it belongs to this guy. He's oh, a retired, uh, you know, on disability, you know, guy and all this stuff. And I was like, oh, well you know, just give it back to him. And, um, but the guy was very grateful. And so gave me a little finder's fear or whatever, but nothing much, but I'm, you know, I was glad to give it back to him, but I just, you know, and I have a Stratocaster of my own today. So, so it all worked out. <laughs> um, <clears throat> there was a, a story that I heard on the news about a, a baby who fell 11 stories and lived with like minimal injury, landed in a bunch of mulch, like two broken arms, a bruised lung, but no brain damage whatsoever. I feel like this is an article from The Onion. It could be. It sounds like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I guess babies are like soft and spongy. Pillowy. Yeah, that's a good word. Um, so there was a story a couple years ago about a plane that crashed over the Amazon and a girl fell 10,000 feet and landed in a, a puddle of mud and had, she lived? had no injuries. She was fine. She had a parachute. <laughs> that would explain it. I could have been, that could have been it. So what else has been going on, Tiff? Well upcoming for me in Fret Napoleon. I'm actually participating in the Fashion for Freedom, Freedom Climb charity fashion show, which is next week in New Orleans at the Eiffel Society um, restaurant slash uh, venue and nightclub where we are going to, uh, you know, which is 
specifically very relevant right now, according to the Nigerian girls that were just kidnapped. Um, what we're trying to do is raise awareness f against human tra sex trafficking. And what's going to happen is we're working with this woman. She's a Cambodian rights activist, and she's gathered about seven up and coming and local designers in the New Orleans and Louisiana area. And uh, what she's doing with them is we're putting on a charity fashion show um, all together that one night on May 23rd at night at 9 p.m. Um, $15 pre-sale, $20 at the door. But the great thing about that is that everything, all the proceeds are going to uh, come right back to all of the different programs that she's working with in order to uh, raise awareness against human sex trafficking. And um, I, I know that a lot of the local girls that uh, y'all might know, I'm going to throw out some names out there that y'all can come and support. Hannah Duron, I believe. Yeah. Uh, Duron, Hannah Duron. Um, she is from Ocean Springs and goes to St. Martin High School. She'll be walking in my particular fashion show. Uh, we'll have Gabrielle Mosier, and she is from Biloxi, and she goes to USM. We also have Sarah Falk. She is from New Orleans, and she recently walked in the Fashion Week New Orleans with Fred Napoleon, as well as, as uh, Padrum <laughs> Couture, who debuted in New York Fashion Week last year, or not last year, but in uh, February of this year, which which is a huge deal and she's actually on their model campaign that they took some pictures of her recently and as well as um, a few other girls um, that we have that are going to be working for such a great cause and um, Fret and Napoleon above all else would love to work with everything in the community because we understand in New Orleans as well as on the Gulf Coast that community is more important than um, just oneself you know providing um, the help to other people as well as their own business ventures and um, nonprofits and what they're trying to benefit is so important to us and we're so happy to work with uh, this organization next week so we're building up everything right now into uh, getting ready for that particular fashion show very cool you tap out Nathan tapped out, tapped out. all right you got any planned things coming up? Nathan just debuted his Seersucker collection. Right on. For the summer. Good deal. That's it. That's it. That's pretty much it for him. If anybody, um, I, d I don't know exactly when this particular podcast will be put up, but tomorrow for the Our Lady of Fatima International Spring Festival, um, Fret Napoleon, my particular clothing and jewelry line, will have a booth set up from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, where the uh, our particular team will be set up um, selling shirts as well as our one-of-a-kind jewelry at the tent next to the uh, the, I'm not sure what the name of the hall is, but it's one of the main halls um, at the festival. So you can stop by and check it out. Other than that, um, our big online presence is with www.frettnapoleon.com and Fret is spelled F-R-E-R-E-T Napoleon N-A-P-O-L-E-O-N and um, soon enough in Hattiesburg, Mississippi Stitched Boutique will be selling our jewelry and over in New Orleans on Magazine Street there is already one particular boutique which is Lucy Rose on Magazine as well as Saint um, on St. Charles there is the Wildlife Reserve um, which <coughs> is a fashion incubator and uh, a particular men and women's southern clothing line too that will be selling our particular merchandise and we're hoping to be in three other stores at the end of may um soon enough with our particular jewelry too Very so cool. definitely check us out right on well I hope y'all both keep the hustle up. Um, I'm very excited about what y'all are doing. I know that everybody on the coast definitely appreciates what y'all got going on. So definitely keep up the good work and we'll be following with y'all and keeping up with your progress and all that good stuff. No problem. Thank you, Stefan, for having us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, that's all for the show. So if you want to go to coastalnoise.com, you can go to the podcast page to hear our other shows. We recently did uh, last episode with Roscoe Bandana. Uh, we're talking with Crest Live. Uh, again, we want to do it with those guys, and they're going to be uh, opening up July 4th. Crest Live is going to open up. They're going to open up their doors and um, take off. with. Do you, you know you've been following that at all? Crest Live? Yeah, yeah. The View Marche. They're remaking it a huge multi 
Purpose Entertainment Center. Amazing. They're going to do, you know, hundreds of shows a year. Um, That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the, you know, they're going to have everything, every kind of uh, music uh, genre. And, uh, you know, they're going to have like American Heritage Museum for Art and, and Coastal Art. bring B-Pace on it. <laughs> B-Pace has his birthday tonight. <laughs> Holla. <laughs> Uh, I don't think <laughs> the uh, the guys uh, uh, Nick Nick Quave he's Mizos what used to be Mizos yes. down on mm -hmm. Government Street is now the Mississippi Juke Joint he's okay. he's the, also the owner of that the the uh, the fillings no the Zeppelins mm -hmm. they're also you know in in, okay. in charge of that, all that stuff so uh, and we do a lot of our podcast down at Mississippi Juke Joint and they sponsor the the podcast and all that kind of stuff so they're cool guys um, and. Uh, June 10th is going to mark the one-year anniversary of Coastal Noise, uh, wow. specifically the Coastal Noise podcast. So, Happy uh, one year. Thank you. Uh, so we'll have uh, the original members, uh, Jeff and Daniel, they'll come on and do another, do a uh, the 33rd show. So that being said, also uh, check out the blog page where I've got the rundown on the Diaryville Crawfish Festival. Some I got some picks up and um, all that fun stuff. So, that's all. Good night, everybody. Good day, whatever time zone you're in.